So thank you for coming here today and also the late ticklers coming in. Um, so I'm going to talk about the last frontier biomimicry and it's, a, uh, you know, it's an aptly, tap, uh, aptly titled mainly because it's my own frontier which I want to reach. Um, and also it's the mimicry I'll talk about, what kind of mimicry we do, and I'm not a mimic by any chance, I'm not a mathematical genius, nor am I a poet. Let me, let me make that clear. <laughs> I, am, I am just a scientist who works in lab, and that's my passion, and that's what I do. And hopefully this passion will be conveyed in the work that I do and the work we do in the field. So, if, but before that, I want to talk about this 18 minutes thing. 18 minutes thing has been bothering me a lot. You'll say, what is this 18 minutes? So I did a quick Google search, 6 o'clock in the morning today, because obviously I had to prepare for this. Uh, so the first thing I saw was, dead man revived after 18 minutes of not breathing. That's a very significant event in somebody's life. You know, according to Harvard Business Blog, you can organize an eight hour work and keep it on track by creating a ritual that would only take a total of 18 minutes. Again, a significant part of every human being's life. And finally, this is probably the most important one, America may soon know that was said during the famous 18 minute gap to the Nixon Watergate audio tapes if the National Archives and Re of uh, Record Administration succeeds in the restoration effort. So those who are old enough to know this, don't raise your hands, but this is, <laughs> but this, is, but this, is this was probably the momentous time in the US history. So 18 minutes is phenomenal and that has changed a lot of things in a lot of the world's lives and a lot of people's lives. Not sure I'll change anybody's life right now in those 18 minutes, but, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll, tell you what, I'll tell you what we do. Now, since this is a story, and there are kids in the audience, I thought I'll start with the expression, long time ago. <laughs> a long time ago, in the pyramids, there were mummies found. And all of you would know what mummies are. On the mummies, they also found a few little stitches. Those stitches are what we call as sutures. On some of the mummies, they also found wooden feet. You know, those what we would call them now as prosthetic feet. The commonality between these sutures and these feet is they're all materials. Those are materials that were put in the body. You know? So those are materials, I mean, if you look at the shape of this, uh, of this it's actually shaped like like somebody's feet, or these are sutures which hold things together. So, in some ways, they were trying to mimic the structure that was present here, and also the geometrical structure of the foot that's present. So I can give a fancy word that we were trying to biomimic things for a long time. And that is not a new thing, it's not something new I do, it's not a rocket science word I use, but people have been doing that for centuries. And our, our uh, you know, history has shown that. Now, this is what we call a time warp music. And there's no music in the background, but you can hum along if you like. So now we go several, several centuries ahead. And then we come to the washing machine dialyzer in 1939. So dialyzer, I don't know how, much of, how many of you know that, but dialy dialysis is used for a lot of kidney patients to take the blood and then clean the blood off, right? So it's like a washing machine in theory. And sometimes in 1930, they also looked like washing machines. <laughs> so, so these dialyzers had actually materials which took blood out and took blood in. So they were what we call them as permeable membranes. You know, permeable means permeates, permeates oxygen and exchange things. So those were permeable membranes which were fit into these dialyzing machines. Very important discovery, very important invention. Moving on to World War II, World War II was, was, was phenomenal. I mean, it was brilliant, it was calamity in many ways, but also, from the materials point of view, it was exceptional, because things happened. Nylon, Teflon, silicones came into being. Phenomenal things, to the extent that they became the fashion of the times. You know, people, this was a fashionable thing to do. You know, put on your nylon, uh, nylon stockings, put on your, PTA, uh, uh, your Teflon stockings, that was, a, you know, people had kitty parties or they had kitchen parties of Tupperware parties showing off the nylon gear, you know. So this was the fashionable thing to do. I mean, I'm not, I don't recommend that now, you know, <laughs> but that, that was a thing to do in World War II. And, you know, interestingly, some of these discoveries, like, for example, a parachute. When people got wounded, what fell next to them was a piece of parachute. 
So the thing, if somebody was bleeding, the first thing they grabbed was this, let's take this parachute, put, me, put it around it, right? That will potentially cause a blood, blood clot, you know? And that was Teflon, you know? And to date, most of the biomaterials are still made of Teflon, you know? So when you see a Teflon, you know what the history, the history was actually in a parachute. You, we don't need to describe what this is, uh, a firefighter pilot, what came from here, the glass from here, you know, is made up of a material called uh, PHEMA, and I won't talk about the description of what that is, but what came from PHEMA was intraocular lens. So the material that was developed there, also, you know, you can imagine somebody, if at all somebody survives, and somebody's eyes or think somebody must have taken some glass, and they actually could see something, you know. <laughs> so potentially, the roots of, of what we call this fancy intraocular lens now, has its roots in, in the World War. <coughs> Again, time works. So we're now moving to our, our, our new generation now, I mean, in the last, last 30 years. So in current day, what we call as biomaterials is, is what we see as the bionic man, and that's a reality, you know? So if a lot of elderly patients, if, we, if they go through airport security, you would actually find an X-ray like that, and that's nothing new. So the bionic man or human or man or woman is not a new concept. It is present. People are living with implants like that. And that's what we call as current day biomaterials. Every implant is made of a biomaterial. Current, bi current day biomaterials are plenty in nature. I mean, so you have, these are vascular grafts of blood vessels, which should be made of Teflon. You have dental implants, you have hip replacements, you have heart valves, you know, uh, patients with pediatric, uh, pediatric patients would get it. That they could be made from pig, uh, uh, pig valves as well. You could have synthetic valves as well. Uh, there are bone screws, and these are, uh, these are mechanical valves, we call them. Uh, these are stents, which a lot of them are made in Galway itself, and a lot of spine, spine replacement surgery. So biomaterials would form in, in, in this, uh, they're all called biomaterials. Now, if you look at the numbers, this is per year numbers, and these are phenomenal numbers you see. And I'm not going to recite these numbers here for you, but you can see that every year there are a lot of implants being used. And the, one of the reasons for that is because our population is also getting older and older and older day by day. So the number of needs that we have as geriatric, as we go older, we would need much more and more. So the need is getting higher. People are getting longer, which also means that implants are failing faster. You know? so, so an implant which would, be, which would be put for somewhere for 10 to 15 years, you know, people, at, if, if somebody got implant 20 years back at the age of 50, one wasn't expected to live more than 65. But now we have a person who's coming back to the hospital table who's 65, what do we, or, you know, or 70, what do we do? Do we put them on the operating table or not? Is a big question for a lot of clinicians. I'm not a clinician, but I'm a, I'm a scientist. So the scientist, what can I do, is a big question that I have. And a lot of people in my field would have that. So the bottom line, we have a lot of implants and that number isn't decreasing day by day. This is an example of a failed heart valve. You know, this is this is heart valve which is made up of from, from pigs, uh, and that's a common thing to do. You know, it's a it's a pig heart valve. Typically, would have been gone to a fifty year old patient, has now calcified. Calcified means a lot of calci uh, calcium deposits on that has now calcified. So this patient had to be put on, and again at the age of sixty five, they would give or get a new valve. You know, there's no choice. You, you one just have to do that. So things are failing. You know, so we have a lot of problems with our current devices. Uh, with breast implants, there's a big history of breast implants failure. Hip prosthesis, they still have a 10 to 50 year, uh, year lifetime. And all of you will know somebody in the family who's got a hip replacement. They are going to fail at some point. You know, hopefully not in one's lifetime. You know? So what we know is that all devices or all implants you know, they will function well at the physical and the mechanical level. So as engineers and as scientists, we have designed very good physical and mechanical structures which will do a good job. I mean, they're not bad. They actually will do a good job. However, biology will answer the question. You know, it's the biology that we have not conquered yet. You know, because most of the things that we have devised are not inert enough. Our body is quite smart. We, you know, we cannot under underestimate our body's capacity for, for what it can reject. It may not reject right away. It may take 15 years to reject. It may take 25 years to reject. But it will reject, you know. But maybe we as scientists or engineers have not done the, have not done the complete job 
of making these, these materials completely inert. So there is something that we need to work on. So this is, to me, it's a new era. This is an opportunity for me as a scientist and for us as scientists to do something new. You know, something, how can we reinvent the biomaterials that we do? You know, so let's go back. Let's go back to simple developmental biology. And now that's a complicated word I just used. Now let's look at salamanders. Salamanders have an amazing capacity to regenerate their limbs. This is a salamander. Uh, this is how it looks like, or newts. If you cut off a limb, or if it does get, it can automatically regenerate its its limb. So there are different. So perhaps there is some cues that we can learn from salamander itself. How do these things happen? What cues does that limb get to regenerate itself? You know, perhaps we can we can look at. There's another example which I didn't write. Is also if a fetus is injured in the body, it can regenerate as well. You know, all mammalian fetuses can regenerate in the body with slight trauma, and there's no incidence of scar. Absolutely not. You know, so there is something amazing in the womb, or there's something amazing also in the cell. I mean, that gives a capacity to regenerate. You know. So either we can make healing materials, healing biomaterials that he heal on their own, or maybe what we call as tissue, and again, that's a very fancy word, tissue engineering, or we can engineer tissues in the lab that can be implanted, or we can use some sort of regenerative medicine, again, some, some medicine that can potentially regenerate it, which can be facilitated by biomaterials. Perhaps those are some of the options. Now, I'm going to talk a bit of science here. Is, if you just take a tendon, and this is, uh, I'm not going to bore you, and if I see a yawn, I'll just stop right there. Is, so there is, this, is a, this is a tendon, and if you, if you take a cross-section, or if you cut the tendon and look under the microscope, there's a lot of bundles, a lot of C fibers, and if you go to that nano scale, or a very, very small scale, you end up with a molecule, a small molecule, which is called the collagen molecule, which most of our tissues are made up of is collagen. So you get collagen in, in cosmetics and everything else. So that's where collagen comes from, is coming from tissues. So this collagen molecule ultimately makes up this tendon, or it also makes up some other tissues. But this collagen is just not placed in the body. It's arranged in a particular way. There is a way things are done. You know, if you look at tendon as a piece of rope, yeah, and that's fine. You know, so that's how it's aligned, that's how it's straight. You know? But there's something else in the rope that's, that's uh, that, uh, there's something else in the tendon that the rope doesn't have, which is cells. So you have cells present in the rope which are producing this new matrix. You know, most deceased states do not have either these cells or neither do they have the structure that's present. You know? So my goal is probably to regenerate this architecture exactly the way. I mean, it's, that's why it's the last frontier. I'm not so sure I'll get in my lifetime, but I need to get somewhere. So in, in, in my own research career, in our research career, we have looked at how can we create architectures of biomaterials? How can we change compositions of these materials to make sure that the cells behave the same way? Can we create different topographies on surfaces and see how these cells will grow? Or more importantly, can we give the right function? So if we put cells on grooves, they will grow nicely. That's, that's, that's an important discovery. You know? is you can, cells will grow in the direction of the grooves. So you can take materials, put grooves on them, nicely they will grow. You, know, you, can, take, you can take some nice uh, materials, in this case it's collagen, put some voltage on this, um, put some voltage on that, and then what you get is nicely aligned collagen fibers in which cells will nicely parallel align with each other. They will parallel nicely and align with each other. So in other words, we can direct the way cells can grow by doing very, very simple things. But in addition, we can create little pockets of function in the, in the matrix. So one way to do that is what we call as niche. You know, cell, little, well, cells can actually hang out, or, or we can put little factors. You know, could be genes, could be different molecules, some little chemicals. You know, they can hang out there. You know, and maybe they can release if required or demand. So if they see a cell that's dying, oh, can I come out? You know, or these cells can do it. So for that purpose, we've, we've called them what we've created these, these are called, these are spheres. You know, these are little niches that we've developed. So these niches can now be loaded into good, good things like genes and, and cells and, and that sort of a thing. And we're the only lab in the world which, which you can do that is create these hollow like, hollow like particles. Some of them give fancy words like nanoparticles and nanospheres and so forth. But well, let's, for this purpose, let's just say they're spheres. These are made up of body's own tissue-like substance, like collagen. 
and we can load them nicely. So now we have these little niches that things can come, can, can come off. We can put these little, little balls, or what you want to call them, in, in, uh, in, in different structures. This is, the, uh, this is a structure I showed you before, like a tendon-like structure, and you can put these little functional units in them. We can put them in little gels, because there's a lot of bo a body, for example, cartilage is gelatinous. So we can take some gels and put these little functional balls in them. Not only that, we can potentially compartmentalize different functions. So in this case, we want cells to live, we want cells to die. Maybe we can do some nice little uh, chemistries and put them or align them properly. You know? So I'll give an example of one of the studies that we've just finished is, uh, is bone, it's a, it was a bone study where bone is made up of two components, and I'm not gonna talk about those components, but they're just mainly here, this collagen is one of them, and calcium phosphate is another one of them. So there's two components in the bone, mainly main components. So if you put these balls of activity here, in this case, we were looking at blood vessels on formation of new bone, we want bone to form again. You know, what we are interested in is how do cells take this? So these are cells, these are bone cells. You know, from this bone plug, we saw that these, these bone cells are taking up these particles that we were delivering. And not only that, they were producing the good molecules that we want. You know? And then, not, and then finally, this is what we want to see, that when we implant them, the new one actually grew. So which is a positive sign. So this is what we want to see. You know? this, was in a very, this was a very small study we did. You know? And we can see the same thing. Can, can we do that with, uh, with chronic wounds? Somebody who has bad ulcers, can we increase the blood supply? Most people whose wounds don't heal have very poor blood supply. How can we do that? So can we take these little balls? Can we put little factors which can add, which can enhance blood vessel formation? And yes, we can. So this is a bl blood vessel in cross-section. That's what they look like, blood vessels. If you cut them, they will look like this. So yes, yeah, so if we can put these little good things in these balls, we can potentially get some nice blood vessel formation, which potentially could have effect in, a, in a, uh, somebody who has special ulcers. So what have we, what have we learned? I, personally, I think it's a new era for biomedicine. It's exciting, there's a lot to be done here. Uh, every implant seems to be failing and not somebody's, uh, uh, somebody's sadness is not my pleasure. It's not what I want to convey. But it is, it is, it is a frontier that, I, that we want to go. You know, we do know that these micro and nano structures in the body do provide some sort of guidance to cells. We know that, we, we found that out. You know, I didn't talk about this today, but we know that if we change the composition, say with collagen, with something else, we can keep the cells a particular natural way. So we can just play with simple compositional things. You know? We can create these little uh, nanoparticles and nanospheres in which this bioactivity can be given. So we can actually deliver things, and we can program that delivery. So we know we can do that. You know? You know? But we also know that we have a long way to go. We are nowhere close to the reality. You know? The true test, and that is personally my dream and my passion, is to take this to the clinic. You know? Maybe, even if I don't, somebody else will. You know? So we do think that biomaterials, uh, if, if I give this message today, I'll be happy, is you know, the new frontier in therapy. So we take these biomaterials, perhaps we can make therapy work for us. You know, maybe things will happen for us. You know? You know, ultimately, you know, I want to have, you know, create biomimicry in which we can actually create the tissues that we want. You know? And rightfully, Scientific American carried this uh, nice apt figure where they showed a bionic human, and that's, that's what we all strive to. With that, thank you. <laughs>